Welcome into another edition of the Hops and Spirits Kentucky podcast. It's another good one. We talk uh, a little bit beyond Kentucky, but bourbon that you can still get in Kentucky. And they're doing some things in Kentucky, too, as you'll hear. That's with Middle West Spirits. But first, our news and notes for the week. It's bourbon heavy, uh, so get ready for that. 15 Stars is releasing their second bourbon, a 7- and 15-year-old private stock. It's called 7-15. and 15. This new expression is a marriage of two selectively sourced Kentucky straight bourbons aged 7 and 15 years and flavor proofed, as they call it, to 107 proof. Uh, with an MSRP of $139. Uh, the limited release is available at select Kentucky retailers and online at cbox.com. And as they told us in our podcast with them previously, once these are gone, they are gone as they continue to just do batch releases right now. The 2022 batch of Old Pogue Master Select Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey will be released in coming months. The batch is only for sale by The Case at this time. Um, the case price for Old Pogue Bourbon is $600 with sales tax included uh, for six 750 milliliter bottles, and there is a limit of one case per customer. If you're interested in purchasing a case, please complete the form at oldpogue.com uh, backslash case dash fulfillment. Uh, cases will be allocated to customers as submissions are received through that link, and they will contact you by email to provide a date in October for pickup at the distillery in Maysville, Kentucky. And last but not least on our news and notes, the Kentucky Bourbon Benefit is featuring an, is an online auction featuring exclusive private barrel selection experiences, rare and vintage experiences, and unique tasting and tourism offerings from Kentucky's signature distillery, distilling industry and hospitality and charitable, charitable partners. The online auction is underway and runs through Sunday, August 21st at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to kybourbonbenefit.com. That is ky bourbonbenefit.com to view the auction items and bid all proceeds will go directly to the state's official team eastern kentucky flood relief fund to assist those impacted by the flooding here recently and we also send our thoughts and prayers out to them as well up next is our q a with ryan lang co-founder and now ceo of middle west spirits in columbus enjoy Remember to check out Hops and Spirits on social media at Hop Spirits, all one word, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also find Hops and Spirits on YouTube and at HopsSpirits.com. Joining us here for our Q&A on the Hops and Spirits Kentucky podcast is just slightly beyond Kentucky, up the road in Columbus, Ryan Lang, co-founder and now the CEO of Middle West Spirits in Columbus. Ryan, welcome in. Thank you. Thanks for having me back on. It's good to see you. I appreciate the time. You've been on the bar conversations a few times and we've had a lot of fun there, learned a, a lot. And for those that may have missed those or maybe new to this, this podcast and the cliff notes version, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, co-founder of Middle West Spirits, uh, uh, you know, not much to me, really just a janitor to uh, pick in whiskey for blends, do just about everything we can do here to operate. But uh, Middle West started in 2008. Uh, we're going on our 15th year here soon, which is crazy. Uh, we're in Columbus, Ohio. We're a uh, craft distillery, more pushing more towards a commercial distillery uh, right now. And we uh, do everything from scratch. So we, we mash, ferment, distill everything here. Uh, we work on our own brands. We've got about 15 different products we produce. And then we have a lot of strategic partners that we work with uh, to co-brand and work on uh, those as well. So, yeah. I still can't believe it's all been almost 15 years. It's, it's crazy. So. <laughs> well, well I, I love how you, you, you mentioned that you guys are kind of becoming that bigger thing than a, just a craft brand any, anymore. And that's kind of evolution area of things. And, you know, it, it works too, because I'm guessing things have changed a lot since y'all launched back in 2008, just a little bit. <laughs> oh, oh God. Yeah. I mean, when we started, 50s, 60s, as far as the actual DSPs listed, registered, and operating. Now it's far, far greater, well over 3,000, pushing 4,000. I don't even know where the numbers are today. Um, so the categories, you know, blossomed. It's blossomed in the state of Ohio, too. There were only, you know, one or two of us then, and then it, it grew. So, yeah, uh, things have changed. Uh, the business model for us has, you know, remained nimble and moved as well. So we've been adjusting as quickly as we can to what is an adjusting, uh, you know, I would say age spirits category primarily for us is trying to keep up with that. So, Well, and, you know, for, for you personally, you know, when, when we first, first talked, uh, you, you told some, some great stories with your family's history with, with distilling and, you know, I mean, what's it like to be able to kind of do that and share in the history that, you know, your, your folks have, 
you know, your family has done and, uh, um, you know, being able to share, share in that. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I often don't talk about it too much. It's, um, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, to, to fall in the footsteps of what, um, you know, I always wanted to get into that, something that our family had been, been doing. Um, and, you know, just to honor that and to, you know, pull that forward as an inspiration. And then, you know, after that, just being able to be, uh, I would say exposed to uh, a lot of people in the category, stalwarts in the category that have been doing it for decades and decades and decades, and then them helping to improve and work with us and just constantly seeking innovation and improving the company. Um, it's, it's a great arc. It's a great arc. It was kind of like, here was the inspiration from the family. And then you get into it and you realize how much it actually costs to do this. And they're like, Oh my God. <laughs> well, uh, and then the doors opened and people have been super, um, gracious to us. They've come in and, and worked with us over the years. And, you know, it's just been a continuation of that and, you know, hopefully many more years to come. And do you still have that still that, uh, you know, magically appeared out of the earth <laughs> there for motivation and, and just yeah. also to showcase? It, it is hidden. <laughs> it's <laughs> never to be used again. Uh, yeah, we certainly have it still. As, as, uh, it's actually at my house. Um, it's kind of a furniture piece at this point. But uh, yeah, we, we look at it every once in a while. We had it recreated for our spirit safe in one of our stills over at the Cortland plant. And we're going to we're going to add some more of those at our, our new facility as well. So yeah, it's definitely been a, a, a pretty amazing journey. Uh, and then to honor their, their backgrounds is something. Well, and then for you, you know, you were an engineer uh, by, mm -hmm. by trade before all this, and then you became master distiller now CEO, maybe met, but we'll, we'll say uh, part of the, the tasting team, blending team now as your, your roles have, uh, evolved over over time and over our chats. I mean, did you ever think this was going to be something that was going to happen? I mean, obviously that's the goal, but to see it come to fruition is a totally different thing. Yeah, I would say um, the velocity of the changes was not anticipated. It happened quickly. Uh, I know we say 15 years, but it did happen fast, the, the growth. Um, I would say the objective for what we had intended to uh, do was always there. There was always a plan for that. And we're very matter of fact about getting to our objectives every year. Um, have we hit them every year? No. Um, have we shot past them some years? Yes. So we've been real nimble in that, but there was always a very clear objective of what we wanted to do almost from day one. Um, how we got there, capital wise, raising money, doing all that stuff, it, it morphed over the years. But, you know, we're proud to say we're still, you know, family owned and independent. So that that was tough, much, much tougher than than some other routes. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think as far as getting to where we are today and where we're about to go over the next, you know, 15, 20 years, what we're planning, what we're laying up, what our long term goals are, was always the case. Unfortunately, it is whiskey and it takes a while. <laughs> you do something today, you kind of got to wait. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, all the adjustments we've made, all the quality improvements, all the adjustments, of barrels and grain and yeasts and seeing that to step now and some of the products that are a little bit, they need a little bit of a longer age on them to start to come to fruition, you know, to validates what we were doing. Now it's about continual investment and time and, and putting resources back to where we're going to go. I, I think the, the biggest underestimation was it just, you know, the whiskey category took off, right? So when we started, it was, yeah, it was kind of there, it was growing, it was going, and then poof, it just really started to accelerate and it continues to accelerate. Any dark spirit category is really accelerating. Heck, tequila is really flying up the boards now as well. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's been a wild ride. Well, and, and in some instances, uh, luck luck works out and that you guys timed it, timed it just right to, yeah. to be able to have some of those older aged spirits that that are yours. And, you know, and you're not having to do what a lot of other folks have to do. And that's either blend uh, source material with their younger stuff or not. And, you know, when you're creating your your blends and, you know, you're, um, you know, you're using grains, some interesting grains. What's it like sourcing, you know, locally and regionally? And why is that so important to, to y'all? Because that's something you've always done. Yeah, it's, it was actually, it's a, you know, what I was just mentioning, it was one of the pillars of the company out of the gate was, okay, my family was in agriculture. 
you know, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. We had farms, uh, dairy primarily. Um, the dairy was sold off and then we kept the ground and, and managed the ground as a family. And, uh, you know, I've always been around. I mean, when you're surrounded in the town of 2,500 people and you're surrounded by farms, you just, there's no getting away from it. It's all around you. So why not take that as a, as a stance and go after the agriculture? Uh, fortunately, Ohio is exceptionally fertile for just about anything. Um, the soil here is uh, very different, north, south, east, west. So we had a we had a palette to play with. Uh, then on top of that, we have a lot of farmers that we work with directly that were allowing us to get really creative with the grains that we were actually uh, turning into seed and therefore turning into um, products for us to actually produce whiskey from or, or vodkas or gins and whatnot. So we we're very lucky in that respect. Um, it's they say terroir. You've heard it. It is a thing. Um, it really does affect, we've grown wheat up North Ohio, we've grown wheat in the Southern parts of Ohio and the distillate's completely different. Batch recipes are the same, yeast are the same, processes are the same, the output is different. And that goes for different styles of corn, different styles of rye, different styles of wheat. It really depends upon the seed you're growing and then where it is grown, how it is treated, how it's managed. So we've played with that a lot over the years and it's kind of been our thing. Um, you know, uh, we, we honor what Kentucky and Tennessee and then obviously in GPI slash Seagram's has done over the years, stalwarts have set the bar and the standard. It's an exceptionally high standard in the category, no doubt, but why don't we try to do something a little different? Why don't we try to go after that? Why don't we try to, you know, do a pumpernickel rye base? Why don't we look at the corn that we're growing for a micro and reserve and make a four grain that's a weeded? but has, you know, a little bit of rye and what would be a traditional wheat of bourbon. So, you know, we've gone after those to, you know, create our sort of uh, calling card with stuff. And then we were fortunate enough that Speyside decided they were going to set up camp in our backyard too. So Speyside uh, put a plant in Jackson, Ohio. Uh, and uh, we have access to Ohio grown uh, oak now. And with what they do from a processing standpoint, we've been able to even make adjustments on the barrels and how they're treated before we get them, before we actually fill them with whiskey. So it's been a whole um, agriculturally focused uh, basis for making whiskey. And we're fortunate in that we don't need to make billions of gallons, <laughs> right? So we can make adjustments on the fly. Uh, we can work directly with farmers, not to say that the large guys can't, but I mean, the, the sheer volume that they go through from raw materials is staggering. So so there's a little bit of a benefit in that we aren't don't have those volumes. So um, yeah, we've been fortunate to be here and have that as kind of a staple of the company. And uh, now you're starting to see the fruits of of that labor over the years uh, coming out in the products. Well, and, and you touched on this too because you guys use some unique to me type type stuff. The one that always comes to mind is the the dark pumpernickel rye, which I, is what I think my favorite. And you know. Wh- how does, you know, using that impact the, the flavor profiles for you? Because obviously there was something in that, the red, the red uh, uh, wheat or winter wheat, I believe. Um, you know, what was it that drew you to those things and to go and use those when maybe others wouldn't? Um, uh, you know, honestly, uh, we, we tried a lot of the standard stuff and, and the distillate that came from the products was, you know, what we expected it to be. Um, Honestly, it was us taking a look at grain catalogs and seeing what grew here, and, you know, different types of corns, different types of rice and whatnot, and what was available. The big thing was, you know, what is grown in the region? And we fortunately have had access to the Ohio Seed Improvement Association. We've had access to OSU and their ag extensions. We've had access to um, some really good brokers that had some unique products that we were able to bring in and try and then we we trial something on a small setup and then it, we'd have to commercialize it then we'd go from you know a couple acres to you know a thousand acres it was that was a transition that was a little tougher but um we tried the products off the still we made adjustments there and we found what we liked it was pretty unique and then really it's a waiting game mm-hmm. then it's taking the barrel filling the barrel, multiple types of barrels, and then sitting and waiting another two, three years. And we did that over and over and over and over, and we're still doing it to this day. Um, I, I'm glad to say we toned in on some things that, <laughs> that we like, 
pumpernickel being one and the corn variety i i'm not allowed to say uh but um those changes uh affect the oils off the still those changes affect the floral capacity or tones off the still they change um basically if you look at a flavor map wheel of whiskey and you look at the grain section of that drastically can be affected by the grains that you grow so uh we had a an open palette and we ended up playing with that quite a bit and we've locked in what we like so that's that was a, a long time coming so it took i mean like i said we're we've been distilling actively for god how many years going on 13 years um and we have done that every single season every single growing season well and and to be able to work with you know folks and, and collaborate to the point of you know working with an ag extension agent to kind of get those i mean obviously it's one thing to to be able to work with just you know throw throw some money around and see what happens but to also just be able to partner with, with folks that are willing to help you out i mean that had to go a long way to what you guys have now been able to accomplish yeah certainly i, I mean in the early days um you know, there, there's just too many people to, to talk about and, and who we worked with in the past. We had gentlemen that worked at um, Seagram's for a long time, uh, and then he became a friend and a mentor, and we still talk all the time. And he's, is a, he's a name that isn't often thrown around in the category. Um, his name's Larry Ebersole. Uh, wonderful guy. He's worked with some really big names out there in, in our craft category, and obviously he's worked with some of the largest distilleries in the world. Um, and then when we had challenges with safety, uh, protecting our employees when it came to moving barrels, I mean, a bear, a loaded barrel is pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? How do we not, uh, injure ourselves? How do we store better for safety and functions? And, and keep in mind, this is back before distilleries in the craft world were really growing. And, uh, we've had doors open through our distributors to some of the larger guys we've been able to work with the likes of um, the guys at Beam. Uh, they've opened the doors and been pretty open about warehousing for us a long time ago. Um, and then some others like them that have done the same. Recently, we were at Old, Old Forester, uh, their new build out, talking to them about some stuff. And, uh, you know, it's a very open community when you get into that. And I've never seen anything like it. My old past as an engineer in other companies, everybody was like locked down watch what you're doing, watch what you're saying. Um, and here it's, uh, how do you just, you know, make the community better? So honestly, we wouldn't be, have been able to do this had we not been able to speak to them and work with those people. So yeah, we're very fortunate. And I think it's a testament to the type of community that we're in. Well, and then, you know, that community has grown for you. You know, you've, You've also partnered with with folks on different things with with some of your whiskeys and and, yep. and and going further than that. I mean, I, I think up there in Columbus, you worked with Brewdog on two different whiskeys. You've worked uh, with some of the breweries around there to do barrel aged beers with them, and I think yep. even an, an ice cream uh, with Jenny's ice cream. So, like, yep. how much fun is that? Because obviously, I'm guessing you get to taste test a few things as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know, that's the honestly, it's one of the funnest parts of my personal job. I wish I had more time to do it. Um, because those collaborations are pretty amazing, but it's also then taking that knowledge that has been passed on to us and then it's passing it on, keeping it going down the chain uh, and working with breweries and the barrel knowledge that we have on that, you know, stuff that we've just learned in the years and that have been taught uh, for the barrel beer late aging has been great. Uh, we have worked with Brewdog on a couple products and doing a Boilermaker series with them. Jenny's, I can't, I mean, we've been working with them for probably almost 10 years. So, um, yeah, that's been great. And, and that that just vein of, of, you know, what we are as a company has then gone even further into like strategic partnerships and the guys we work with and other distilleries that are, you know, up and coming. And, and we've worked with a handful of them to try and get them rolling and see their, seeing their success is also uh, great for us because, you know, that was the goal. You know, if you set out to actually achieve something and you see them succeeding as, as well as what we feel we're doing, then, you know, everybody's winning. Well, I, I was going to say that, and this kind of goes for, for probably both my next two questions, because I've had Horse Sol Soldier Bourbon on uh, on the Hustle Spirits Kentucky podcast in the past. And they talked about, you know, that teaching uh, that, you know, that you're able to go in there and 
while you guys, you know, weren't exactly doing everything for them, you were still passing along knowledge so they could do it as they would, they would go. And then I've seen, you you know, talking to classes at at the university and, and the schools there. I mean, how important is it for you since, like you said, you got that knowledge passed to you to now share that with, you know, quote unquote, the next uh, wave of of distillers and distilleries. Yeah. I I think it goes back to the earlier communication on, on the community. Um, It's, it's kind of your duty in some respects to carry it on uh, because there really isn't a university for this. There's no, Hey, go to the, you know, university of Sussex to <laughs> learn how to be a bourbon producer. They're, they're, I, I think some of the universities are, are working on that. Um, I don't know that if that's been completed or yet or not, to my knowledge, you have moonshine U, which does a lot of that, uh, which gets people to a certain level, but um, when you get in and you get the intricacies of decades of experience in an individual, and every single time I talk to some of these guys, I sit and I shake my head again. I'm like, you could have told me that 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm like, thanks. You're spoon feeding me what, what over time. Um, so that knowledge base, if you don't continue it on, that tradition uh, can be lost. So very easy transition to some of the guys that we work with and we'll continue to. I don't, we're never going to stop that. Um, and uh, now it's more about timing than anything. We're, it's unbelievable how busy the category has become. It's more about finding the time to do that, which is harder. Uh, but it's an enjoyable part of the, uh, you know, the journey, the path of this uh, of this world. And uh, we've been fortunate to be able to help some people out along that. Well, and you touched on it. You know, your your business has grown to where now you do have strategic partners that that you do work with. Like I said, uh, Horse Soldier Bourbon's one of them, and. I'm guessing, did you ever think that was going to be part of the, the plan or was that kind of written in there like, hey, well, well, this is something we'd like to get to at some point? Because obviously, you know, when you can you know, do, do some contract work and different things or partner with folks uh, to grow is, is always a good thing. I would say that, yes, there was always, uh, again, a, a, uh, a North Star guiding us towards that. Um, how we morphed into it, uh, changed it, mutated over the years. Um, but, uh, yeah, certainly we were going to do that. We were going to only select a short amount of, of people that we could really hone in on and help with. And, and I think that was where we missed a little bit is that, uh, that, uh, the need was greater than what we had realized. Um, so we just kept growing. We kept adding infrastructure to support. We continue to do that now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that the reward in educating and working on that or being educated and, and carrying that on is should be a big part of why you do this. Um, every distiller that has come to our facility, everybody we've had over the years, I think one or two had previous distilling experience. So we've taught. So not much. <laughs> yeah, taught and taught and taught, yeah, over the years and we bought in people that were in pretty significant breweries that brought their institutional knowledge in for cleanliness and things like that. So we've just been adding it over time. And then customer comes in once work with us. We, we don't hold that back. We pass all that on right away and hopefully it, it vaults them into what they're trying to accomplish. Well, and then, you know, obviously you all have been able to accomplish a lot. You've got, as we'll talk about the bourbons here in a second, you've got the OYO uh, line of vodka and then the Vim and Patel uh, gin. Uh, you talk a little bit about those and how those uh, have been going for you, for y'all. Yeah. Uh, so we have the, the OYO vodkas, uh, the Vim gin, and we have a new gin launch coming out in the next month. Uh, we, we can't put the press release out on it yet, but we've been working on it for some time. So it gets launched here soon. Uh, they were basis of uh, soft rubber and wheat. That was our first grain. We really started to hone in on from where it was produced and how it was produced. And, uh, you know, that became the vein of our distillate. Um, and we, we distilled to almost 192 off the still to make the base. And, um, you know, it, uh, it still has a little bit of character to it from the wheat and rather than neutralizing through carbon activation, which is what traditionally is, is done, uh, we kept it. And that became, you know, our flavor because there are, let's be honest, there are a fair amount of vodkas on the shelf. Um, and if you're going to distill it yourself and you want to have something that's a little unique, that's what we did. And we've got the wild vodka, the honey vanilla bean vodka, 
uh, and the stone fruit vodka, and then the bourbon barrel aged honey vanilla bean vodka. All of those are uh, from fresh fruits, fresh, raw, real honeys, uh, real vanilla beans, um, macerated and processed. The gins, um, we've got again the same base, the wheat base. So the Vim's base is the uh, what would have been the base for for the vodka. We distill it to a different uh, proof, obviously, and uh, it's an 18 botanical gin. It's culinary inspired. Uh, so we had our chef at the time uh, help us with some pretty unique uh, botanicals that created that product. Uh, the new gin is a, a very strong take on and a very traditional uh, product in the gin category, which will be launched here soon. And that was kind of the, the category that went for the wheat. Uh, so yeah, the clear spirits have, have stayed very Ohio. Well, and then obviously you have the bourbons, which are now all under the, the middle West label. What's, what's it been like to, to build on those and, and how, how has that process gone for y'all? Yeah, I, I think the, um, the first challenge was splitting the brands, you know, several years ago, we just couldn't carry the parent Ohio through everything or the, the Ohio to the parent Middle West. So we always knew we wanted to split the brand. So that was the first challenge. And, and it, it still be, can be a challenge. Oh, you're Middle West, but who makes Ohio? No, it's all the company, Middle West Spirits. We make all these house and family of brands. Um, so splitting that off was the first challenge. Uh, then, you know, second was just over time, getting it right and then finding the core products we wanted to produce and then taking them and you know working on them as well from you know double casking and things like that and then uh you know i think we're just scratching the surface of what that offering is going to be so we've got the wheat whiskey base which was the first one obviously as it was the base for our vodka we then turned it into a whiskey the difference is is we have a five percent barley malt addition to the wash as opposed to the vodka which is 100 percent wheat or 95.5. Uh, and then uh, with the rye whiskey, we have the pumpernickel rye whiskey, but it's a four grain rye. So it's 80% rye. It is 10% uh, corn. Uh, it is 5% or soft red or wheat and 5% barley malt. And then we have the Michael and Reserve bourbon, which is the four grain bourbon, which has been, I would say the most challenging for us to get right, the balance of the rye, uh, to the wheat has been, you know, challenged, but the, the adjustments we've made four and five years ago are now starting to come out in slow amounts and greater amounts here soon. But um, the uh, that product is 63% corn, 19% uh, wheat, 13% rye, and the remaining balance is the uh, the barley barley malt. So, you know, those are the, the platforms or the foundations that are, have been poured uh, for, you know bigger age profiles and potential name changes when it came to, you know, for instance, like going from uh, piggyback to boss hog and all these things, the basis is the same. We're doing the same thing. We just need time. And then our first release on, on a continuation of that was the double cast series where we got them to a certain age, flipped them to um, the next level of casks and then did double casking of that and then cast strength of that. So that family of whiskeys is only going to morph over time, get larger ages on them and then have more offerings out of them. So really excited about where those are going. And I was going to say, how much fun is it for that double cast collection for you to, to do that? Cause I feel like that's where you really get to probably experiment a little bit more and your team gets to, to do a little bit more fun with it. Certainly. Yeah. Um, when you're going in and trying to select the right port cask or the right, sherry casks, the right other additional wine casks to blend over or just flat Hungarian oak, no aging for double oaking, things like that. Um, there's a plethora of options out there. Um, and we've tried a lot of them. We've tried a lot that didn't work where, you know, you'd age them out over time and they just, they didn't, they never became into balance, right? They never mm. came to a point where like, wow, that hit and it didn't have a, an off flavor, off note, tannins were out of whack. Um, so it, it was, a, a you know, again, it's a wait and see for us. So it's a, we think this is going to work. We tie it to a specific product type, usually when it's in bottle. So we'll mm -hmm. take a specific product and we'll see how they partner together and how the flavors blend together. And then we get empty barrels, we fill them and then we wait. And we've had products that we've tried it, you know, six months and okay, it seems like it's right. 
nine months. Well, we're going the right way. Hit a year and you're like, uh-oh, well, we just ruined that. And then you're like, well, let's just wait another six months. Well, it's coming back in. All oh, two years is perfect, right? So, uh, and, and perfect for us is getting ready to where you put it in a bottle and somebody's like, wow, like, okay, you're, you got something here. And then, then we focus on getting volume of it. So, um, you know, it's, it's been an interesting experiment and stuff we do get to creatively play with just like we do with the grains and it spans the gamut. And sometimes those, uh, those trials and tribulations don't pan uh, out, but sometimes they do. I was going to say, that's the downside to the whiskey and bourbon world is time. You got to wait and then you got to hope. And that sometimes uh, those are not exactly what any businessman loves to do. Um, yeah. You know, as we kind of you know wrap up, anything else new? I mean, you mentioned uh, a new gen that we will say we'll, we'll keep your eyes out for. Anything new, new releases coming down the line that you can at least maybe tease or mention? Yeah, the next round of the double casking is coming out for holiday. Uh, so we're getting ready to do those barrel selects here soon to get them into O&D. Um, looking forward to that. We've got a lot laying up, uh, more age on them. We'll see what happens, see what comes out of them. And uh, yeah, we have the, the new gin that we're working on. Um, bourbon cream's coming back out for holiday. Um, we're That's a seasonal thing for us. So we're getting ready to go through processing for that again, get it into packaging. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the next two years, we're working on some different styles of whiskeys and some cross-pollinated products, I'll mm. say. Uh, <laughs> that would be real interesting. Uh, I would say they're not at their, they're not beyond their R&D phase yet. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so we're still working. I, I love that. And, and I guess my last question for you is, obviously, you've got the expansion that you guys have been going through, building out. I mean, what's the future hold for you in Middle West and kind of what's, on the horizon as far as just the, the big picture? Yeah, um, I think the big picture is continuing to reinvest in our, our people uh, and our facilities. Um, we're fortunate that with the velocity that we've had, um, we're able to start focusing a little bit more. Um, I mean, we, we still want to push as much as we can in getting people trained and, and operating properly, but, you know, that's going to be far more of our focus than it's ever been over our last 15 years. So really excited to get into that uh, internally. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's our path forward on, on the internal side. Uh, externally. Yeah. Uh, adding barrels as many as we can. Um, there's obviously a, a barrel issue in category, which I'm sure you've heard about. So we're, we're doing our best to lay up as much whiskey as we can for our, ourselves and also our partner brands. So yeah, more of the same, just a lot more of it, hopefully. <laughs> well, well, fingers crossed that that uh, your you know other things don't get in the way of that that you you yeah. can't control. And and as always, you, know, you can find Middle West Spirits on the shelves here in Kentucky, of course, up in Ohio yeah. and elsewhere. And Ryan, thanks for coming on, sharing uh, uh, a little bit more about what's what's going on in Middle West. And I appreciate it as always. Yeah, thanks for the time. Good seeing you again.